Hello and welcome. My name is Thomas Skevitz, and I'm here to talk about 4-H opportunities for the citizens of Hadley. We have seen a resurgence in 4-H in the past few years that we haven't seen in the last two decades. This is symbolic of the back to the land movement that we're experiencing not only in New England, but across the country. There's also a movement back to family values, back to activities that the whole family can become involved in. Sons and daughters, nephews and nieces, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. So the basic question is, what is 4-H? 4-H is the Youth Development Program of the University of Massachusetts Extension. It's an outreach program. The purpose of 4-H is to take the research from land-grant universities, like the University of Massachusetts, and bring it out to the communities across the Commonwealth. Through working with departments such as sociology, psychology, chemistry, animal science, and others, 4-H staff and volunteers work with small groups of youth in project areas. These groups of, of youth ages 5 to 18 work in every kind of area uh, project that you can think of. For example, while many families in public think about 4-H, they think about animals. When you go to the 4-H fair, whether it's Cummington, Three County, Big E, Westfield, or Greenfield, you'll see 4-H showing their sheep, goats, dogs, rabbits, oxen, beef, just like they did at the Hamden County 4-H Fair uh, a couple weeks ago in, uh, at the Big E. And that's typical. And that's largely because of the agricultural base that 4-H has. In 1902, when 94% of families lived on farms, there was a movement by researchers at land-grant universities across the country to take the research in terms of land development, crop rotation, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and bring these out to the farm so that they could increase their production and their capacity. While many farmers embraced this new technology, there were also some that thought, if it ain't broke, don't break it. And they stayed with their tried and true traditions and practices. So faculty, staff, researchers, and extension agents, as they were called at the time, uh, visited the farms and started working with the sons and daughters who really gravitated to all the new bells and whistles. As a result, we saw the Green Revolution occur, and farms today, even though they represent only 3% of the population, are now up producing what years ago 94% of the population were turning out. 4-H is a youth development program, and while 4-Hers live on farms, urban areas, suburbs, cities, everywhere, because we are in Boston, we are in Springfield, we are in Greenfield, uh, and we are in Northampton. Um, they are involved in things like rocketry, sign language, citizenship, and the traditions that you think of, gardening, sewing, and animal science. I just want to cite two examples just to show you, though, how wide the breadth is of 4-H projects. When our son became 4-H age, we started the Hadley 4-H Young Astronauts in town. My wife and I were the club leaders, and these 4-Hers, the club eventually became uh, large. It, there were 32 4-H youth who met right in the basement of the former Hooker School. Uh, they were involved in making control panels like you would see on the, the shuttle. They were making um, rockets. They started out with bottle rockets using air and water pressure and gravitated to gunpowder rockets. Uh, and these would, were fired annually at the Hopkins Academy. We used a mound at the Hopkins Field for our launch pad. And those rockets would go upwards of 1,800 to 2,000 feet and would tr attract a big crowd. This 4-H club also built a solar system using giant pumpkins. Uh, the solar system encompassed the town of Hadley. The sun was, as you might expect, at the town hall. And the outlying planets were on the borders of Sunderland, Amherst, South Hadley, and Northampton. Each site uh, had a placard that described what those planets were, uh, and it really became an educational experience. That's just one example of a non-traditional 4-H club. When our daughter Julie became 4-H age, she was interested in sign language. And so we started the Hadley 4-H Sparkles Club. Uh, this group of eight youth got involved in learning sign language, the alphabet, the words, they were signing to songs in front of audiences. And what also happened there, and it's just to show you how flexible the 4-H program is, on a field trip, a club field trip to the State House in Boston, um, the club was enamored with the Hall of Flags. And if you haven't been to the State House recently, the Hall of Flags is a giant hall filled with just about every flag 
of the cities and towns across the Commonwealth. When the 4-Hers ask the person at the door, where is the uh, Hadley flag located, uh, they found through the book Hadley didn't have one. On the way back, the 4-Hers were abuzz talking about, could we come up with a Hadley flag? And they took on the challenge. They met with many town groups, the Hadley Selectmen. Uh, they met with all kinds of organizations in town to get their opinions on what should be part of the 4-H flag. They then put out uh, an appeal. They put out an application process to the general public. In all, 82 entries came in. Everything from pencil and paper drawings to elaborate artistry to, to photographs. The 4-H club whittled that down to eight finalists. And at a spring town election, the town clerk uh, allowed the 4-Hers to uh, set up a display outside the gymnasium in Hopkins. And the townspeople voted, uh, as well as the students at the Hopkins Elementary School, on the town flag. And as a result of that 18-month process, uh, you could see the, the town flag flying proudly in front of the town hall and at our town parades. What a learning experience for a 4-H'er. A youngster who's sixth, uh, seventh, eighth grade, to learn not only about being a citizen, about community service, about politics, but also about the, the specifics and logistics. And all that is involved with designing and, and selecting and eventually voting on and, and then manufacturing a flag. So that's what you can do in 4-H. Again, most people, if, you, if I ask you on the street, what do you think when you think about 4-H? Uh, they will say farm animals. Because of our agrarian roots, we are that. I just want to continue to stress that you as a forage volunteer can do any project that you want with the youth in your family or your community, your neighborhood. Absolutely no limit. What it makes 4-H unique? A couple things. One is because we're part of the University of Massachusetts, again, a land-grant university, and we have the latest research, we're also connected to every single other land-grant university across the country. There are presently 74 land-grant universities. So if you as a potential forage volunteer had some youth that were interested in a project and UMass wasn't noted for its research in its project, say for example it might be photography or public speaking or citizenship, I would contact one of my colleagues at Utah State or Michigan State or Cornell and then quickly, we would get those materials sent to us and ultimately to you. As a 4-H volunteer, we would make sure that you were screened and quarried for the safety of the community and the youth. We would also make sure that you had the project materials that you needed and you would be supported by 4-H staff and a mentor. A mentor would be a senior 4-H volunteer who either has knowledge of the project area that you're working in or is geographically close to you and therefore is accessible to you. Uh, we have thousands of 4-H volunteers across Pioneer Valley serving tens of thousands of 4-H youth. I want to mention some of the methods besides the 4-H club. We also reach tens of thousands of students in our schools through a number of in-school projects. The number one that comes to mind in many people's minds are the embryology projects, which is learning about chick hatching, egg hatching. And through that process, students learn about life, uh, they learn about development, uh, they learn about the system in the body, the blood system, muscular, uh, everyone, everything, A to Z. Another popular 4-H uh, in-school project is babysitting or child care. And we work with local communities, and Hadley has a strong history of this. We work with uh, the police chief, the fire chief, the school nurse, nutritionist, and we run our 4-H uh, um, students through an eight-hour program. They learn about first aid. They learn about child safety. Um, they learn how to handle emergencies. They learn how to respond to the, the child's needs uh, in every which way possible. We have each year uh, held a babysitting program, and we anticipate we will again in January at the um, Hopkins Academy. 4-H clubs meet everywhere. They can meet at your home. They can meet in the school. They often meet in the library, youth centers, on farms, at stables, anywhere and everywhere. A club system in the club, uh, the 4-Hers generally meet once every other week. 
they have a typical club business meeting that starts off their meeting that will run anywhere from five to ten minutes. And this is an opportunity for our 4-H youth to learn about the Roberts Rules. They oftentimes have officers, depending on the age of the youth. If they're younger, ages five to eight or nine, we recommend that they rotate those club officers so everyone has an opportunity to be president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. If they're older, uh, middle school, high school, oftentimes they hold that officer position for about a year and they learn about all the roles of the officers. They will in be invited to attend an officer training. Uh, they will be watching other clubs, senior clubs that have been around in existence to see how they operate. After that five to 10 uh, minute business meeting, the clubs go into the, the project, whatever that is. 4-H's slogan is learning by doing. Therefore, that 4-H volunteer that I talked about, while they are a club volunteer, they often act in the role of an advisor. They want to let the 4-Hers have that hands-on experience to learn the project, to construct something, to problem solve something, to learn about group dynamics and decision making. And while 4-Hers have projects like the ones I mentioned, the quote project that the 4-H volunteer has, that's the youth that they work with. You see, it really doesn't matter if a youth makes a perfect model car or takes a perfect photograph or sheeps, uh, shears a sheep perfectly. What matters in the volunteer's mind and, and ultimately is how is that youth developing? Developing. Are they becoming confident? Are they developing increased skills? Are they feeling more comfortable with themselves? Are they helping out? Are they being mentors to younger 4-Hers? And for the younger 4-Hers, are they building confidence? Are they learning how to incorporate new skills? Are they learning how to share? And some themes that run through every single club, no matter what the project are, are citizenship, leadership, and community service. Those are key. So we will give 4-Hers every opportunity to become valued citizens in their community. We will give those 4-Hers every opportunity to assume a leadership role, whether that carries a title or not. And we definitely will encourage every single 4-H -er and every single club to be involved in a community service club and a community service project. And those projects range from everything, from visiting the, the, the soldier's home in Holyoke to working at animal science, animal uh, health uh, hospitals, to visiting the elderly, food drives, whatever. But 4-Hers come to value the fact that they can give back to their local community. There are also two other important facets of 4-H clubs that I want to mention. 4-Hers are strongly encouraged to develop public speaking skills. In 4-H, we call it visual presentations. And the way that presents itself as 4-H is the 4-Hers will pick a topic that they are really enamored by, that they feel very confident and comfortable in presenting. Oftentimes it's their project, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's their hobby. It might be a trip the family took. It might be a favorite site that they went to. It might be a challenge that they overcame the previous year. And they'll present that talk, oftentimes using um, products in front of them or they're constructing something. They'll present that to a small group of listeners for anywhere from five to seven minutes. Uh, the listeners will then ask questions, and the 4 H is then invited to do it to a larger crowd at the regional level, and again, a larger crowd at the state level. Our 4 Hers are some of the best speakers uh, that you can imagine. They become confident, they can handle questions, they know how to use humor, they can formulate a speech from introduction to the main body to summary, they know how to use props, um, and they do a bang up job. We eventually ask these 4 H's if they'd like to become ambassadors. And these are our spokespersons for 4 H's. These are the 4 H's, these are the youth that will speak to our legislators and to groups in town, like the Farm Bureau, for example. The second key component of a club uh, that we promote are records. Records are what you might call a portfolio. It's um, a written version of what that 4 H has done over the past year. Uh, and it's pretty, the, it, it can contain a lot of minutia, but also the main themes of what they've done in terms of, again, overcoming obstacle, obstacles, setting goals, and did they achieve them? What about the finances of that project? Was there a cost? Was there a benefit? Was there any income? What about the leadership you've developed? 
what about the friends you've made? And our favorite part of the 4-H story is, of the 4-H record, is what we call the 4-H story. And this is about a one to two page summary of what to them was the essence of that 4-H year. And it's really incredible what they come up with. Uh, and this is what a lot of the volunteers spend time on when they evaluate the records. They want to see that growth, the growth that occurs in that 4-H's eyes. How did they come from point A to point B? The records when 4-H uh, starts are very, very thin, uh, less than a quarter inch. When they become age 14, 15, and 16, they're pretty hefty, uh, almost on the dictionary size level. And it's a, a document that those 4-Hers really come to cherish and that they will keep with them for the rest of their life. What does it cost to join 4-H? Just like every other organization, 4-Hers have a small charge of $60 annually. And this covers their insurance, it covers entry to a lot of events, it covers scholarships, and it covers some office supplies. For no reason, though, should a 4 h -er ever be excluded from 4-H for a monetary reason. Therefore, I'm happy to say that we've got scholarships for those families, especially those that have more than one 4 h -er. We know right now the economy is still uh, not out of the woods, and families are often stressed with food and energy costs. Um, so therefore, we've got the support of what's called the Massachusetts 4-H Foundation. This is a foundation based in Ashland, Massachusetts, and their goal in life is to support 4-H clubs. They do this through scholarships. They do this through initiatives that clubs have. For example, if a club has an idea for a project, a field trip, uh, or anything, a concept, uh, they would write a paper, a small um, one-page one um, grant application to the foundation, and more likely than not, they would be supported. So we're very happy about that. Of course, the volunteers, there is no charge to that. We're, we, we just appreciate all that you give uh, to the 4-H program. Right here in Hampshire County, we're fortunate to have Camp Howe. Camp Howe was the first 4-H camp in the Commonwealth. We have five. There's one at Camp Farley on the Cape, Georgetown, in Middlesex County, in Spencer, and then the one at Camp Howe. So when you think of camp, what do you think of? A waterfront, recreational activities, crafts building, high ropes course. We've got it all at Camp Howe. It's a great facility, and what makes Camp Howe an award-winning camp even more special is that the counselors come from across the globe. It's an international staff. We have counselors from France, Greece, Australia, Britain, and every year, it's a, uh, even though some counselors come back, it's a changed look. And our Camp 4-Hers learn so much, not only about their cabin mates and the skill that they develop. They might learn how to swim. They might gain confidence in the high or low ropes course. They also pick up a global perspective from our counselors, and we're very fortunate to have that. Another unique feature of Camp Howe is it's part of Camp Echo. Camp Echo is another award-winning camp that works with youth with special needs, oftentimes a one-to-one -one counselor to camper. Camp Echo and Camp Howe are interwoven so that the campers from each get to work closely and communicate with and become close friends with each other and gain an appreciation for each other's special skills, special characteristics that they bring, and they become lifelong friends. Some people want to know how 4-H originated. originated. I, I mentioned that it started in 1902. Uh, a number of states claim to be the founding uh, universities of 4-H, and that, we feel that's kind of great that so many places want to claim to be the, the father, uh, the, the birthplace of 4-H. Of Georgia claims that it was started there with the Corn Club. Ohio claims that they started 4-H with the Potato Club. And UMass Amherst claims that they started 4-H with the Gardening Club. So we have many, uh, many universities and land grants that, that claim to be the founders. But we did settle on, even though we can't settle on the fact that there is a, one, lo one location, we do claim uh, the 1902 as the founding year. I want to mention at the federal level that we are part of the Department of Agriculture. That's where we're historically based and continue to be. We also have, though, something called the National 4-H Council. I mentioned the foundation in Massachusetts as our private arm within the Commonwealth. The National 4-H Council is our private arm at the federal level. 
The reason I mention that is whether you're a 4-H family or not, whether your son or daughter belongs to a 4-H club or not, I highly recommend that if you are going to vacation or visit the Washington, D.C. area, that you, consider, that you consider staying at the 4-H Center in Chevy Chase, Maryland. It's a bus stop and a subway stop from downtown D.C. It was a woman's college donated to 4-H by President Eisenhower in 1955. 4-H has turned it into an educational conference facility. We contract, contract out with Marriott. It can house 700 people. It's got great food. It's a beautiful campus. It's kind of kid-proof. Uh, there's a big rec hall with foosball, uh, billiards table, ping pong table, uh, volleyball court. Sits on four acres in a gorgeous setting. It's a very safe environment. It's just a fun place, uh, um, a very uh, low, in, low expense place uh, to settle down. And then you can spend days touring Washington and just relax when you come back to the center. 4-H's emblem is the 4-H clover, the green and white 4-H clover. I talk uh, about that because it's one of the most respected, well-protected symbols in the United States. In uh, the early 1900s, Congress recognized that and placed, placed the 4-H clover along with the, 4-H, along with the presidential seal, the Supreme Court seal, and the Olympic seal as the four most protected symbols in the country. In fact, the 4-H symbol is the only one that is a federal law to place anything over that symbol. The 4-H pledge covers it all, and it goes like this. Every 4-H club member says that at the beginning of, the beginning of their club meeting. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and in 1964 they added, and my world. The motto, as I mentioned, is to make the best better. So no matter where you come into the 4-H club system as a 4-H'er, we want to do everything in our power as staff and as volunteers to ensure that we take it to the next step. How do you find out more about 4-H? You can call the 4-H office. It's right here in, in Amherst, right on the Hadley Amherst line, 413-545-0611 or visit our website, mass4h.org. Thank you for listening to this. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.